Hello everyone and welcome back to day 35 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So um, two streams earlier this week, um, we worked on some compiler stuff, um, implemented two features um, that, would, uh, th that will become very useful and, and also serve just for, pers for me personally as a palate cleanser. Um, but now we are back to our regularly scheduled sort of roadmap and um, Today, as promised, we will start working on a, um, a fourth system. So um, I'm not going to do a big intro to fourth, and I'm also actually not an expert at all. Um, I've, I've used various incarnations of it. Uh, I've implemented simple fourths before, but um, I don't want to do a big spiel about it. And I actually think for a systems programming focused uh, series like Bitwise, uh, looking at how things are implemented and kind of inferring you know, and kind of taking that approach to it is probably um, better anyway. But if you um, if you want to, I guess, learn it in a more traditional way, there is this uh, old book which is now available for free online called Starting Forth. Um, there's also a complimentary book called Thinking Forth, which is more about higher level sort of forth programming, higher level in the sense of um, you know how to think about problem solving with forth, which um, Fourth is a little bit weird if you're coming from a traditional programming background, and so it's a lot about kind of rewiring, we rewiring how you think about uh, uh, structuring programs and solving problems. So uh, you can uh, check that out if you're uh, once once you're past this. But otherwise, uh, it's available, I guess, in both HTML and uh, PDF, so you can check it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the basic idea behind Fourth is that it's a stack-oriented language. Um, uh, there's no, you know, named local variables, at least not in the sort of the primeval fourth uh, subsets um, that that most people use. Although if you use something like ANSI fourth, it has all kinds of bells and whistles. Um, but but yeah, um, I thought. Uh, oh yeah, and the other things I wanted to mention um, before I start, uh, before I dive in, is uh, I wanted to mention sort of two fourth implementations. And again, they're not fourth implementations in the sense that they're implementing a standardized language because fourth is this fairly mutable thing that contains a couple of core ideas that tend to recur pretty much unchanged, um, but otherwise differ dramatically in the details. And so um, these are uh, uh, these are two thing, uh, two implementations that are worth studying, and they both come with excellent documentation so that you can learn from them without you know, having to painstakingly study the source code in detail. Um, the first one is this entry from the IOCCC, the International Obfuscated C Code Contest. Um, we're just, see if I get all the Cs right. International Obfuscated C Coding Contest. Yeah, I think that's the, the correct number of Cs. Um, so this is a one of the winning entries from 1992. Um, it stands out from, um, let's see what the other files are. Um, yeah, and actually he had two entries that I guess won this year. Um, I'm trying to remember what this one is. Oh, that was the wrong one. Um, okay. Yeah, so this is, a, okay, I actually don't remember this one, but this looks like another language type tool with some cool stuff. But anyway, uh, you might recognize this name if you're from around these parts. Um, a buzzard is actually uh, Sean T. Barrett's, uh, STB's old uh, old nickname. And uh, I think he has at least two of these entries, well, maybe even three. I think there's at least one from a later year where he won one as well. Um, but the one I, that I actually came across before I knew him personally is this one. Um, which is basically a fourth system, which is bootstrapped from a, uh, a very minimalistic core um, called first. And um, and he's very, you know, unlike a lot of these IOCCC entries, he has a very good sort of tutorial-like walkthrough of how things are built up in stages. And, um, you know, if you know absolutely nothing about fourth, this might be like you might not quite know what you're walking into, but but it's still still pretty self-contained, so it, it it would be a good one to check out. Um, you know, there's some design choices and how he bootstraps that are um, probably not how anyone would do it if they weren't trying to do something like an IOCCC entry. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there's a bunch of 
ideas that recur uh, or reusable in you know in, in other settings and so um, definitely I would check this out uh, it's very cool and actually while I was um, doing the pre-stream I realized that uh, maybe people don't know about how many great uh, IOCCC entries there are to study uh, I think the IOCCC has a I think deserved reputation for you know being fo focused uh, on surface level obfuscation um, you know, like if you look at the, uh, if you look at the corresponding C file for this, you know, it's, well, actually this is not very obfuscated as far as these things go. Um, is this the unobfuscated one? No. So you can see, the, okay. <laughs> So I guess he intentionally didn't really obfuscate this, and so the obfuscation is more elsewhere. But if you look at most of these entries, they tend to be like, I don't know, let's pick a random one. I mean, this is actually not bad either, because it actually has white space. But you know, anyway, a lot of the entries have, have a huge amount of sort of syntactic compression and surface level obfuscation. Um, but they also tend, to, at least the better entries in my mind, tend to also have a lot of semantic compression, like a lot of really cool uh, ideas that, that enable uh, things to be expressed so concisely. And um, it's often hard um, for people to actually see that because they get stuck on the surface level obfuscation. So that's always been a pet peeve of mine. Um, but a lot of my favorite entries um, actually come with, uh, for example, like this design doc or design walkthrough. Um, or um, what is in many cases almost as good, they come with a unobfuscated version of the C file. So I just wanted to mention um, one other, maybe two other examples of IOCCC entries that you might find uh, fun to study. Um, and the first one is obfuscated. I think it's, uh, is that what it's called? Yeah. So um, this is uh, for, for, for Fabrice Ballard's uh, winning entry, which is a, a small self-hosting C compiler. Yeah, so it is self-hosting. Uh, it's not compiling. It, it, it compiles directly to x86 code. It doesn't support you know, all of C, but again, it supports a, a subset that's sufficient to compile itself. And, and, and also the subset is actually ANSI C. Right, like in other words, it's not just a C-like language; it's actually C, albeit a subset. Um, and so, I mean, here's an overview, I guess, of what what it supports, but it, it doesn't really, um, you know, it doesn't really walk through the design. But if you look at the code, um, okay, this one. Well, for the first thing you should notice is it's very small. Um, is this the pre? Okay, so this is maybe not a good example. I know for a fact that there is a. Um, what's it? Okay, I guess it's on his website. Right. This one. Apparently, the, these do not self compile because they use some features like probably the C3 processor, which are not supported. Um, but yeah, um, so um, this compiler is interesting for a few reasons. I mean, the first is, I mean, it's not necessarily how you would write another type of compiler, but uh, it can certainly show you how you can do uh, something extremely minimalistic that can self-host um, while still being valid C. Um, and the other interesting historical note about this is this is the... A predecessor. I mean, this was the starting point for uh, his later project called TCC, which is a, uh, um, a fairly complete C compiler. I mean, it compiles, in fact, it not only compiles uh, most of C99, but it also compiles like MSVC specific and GCC specific extensions. Um, and it, if you, it, it's funny because if you look at some of the weird uh, shorthand uh, function names like O. Which is pretty short, right? Uh, I think if you look at the current LCC code, I believe he still has, um, you know, if if you look at like, uh, like something like this, 
yeah, I think these things are still like a, a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these things are basically still there, which is kind of amusing. They're still called like GSIM. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to check this out um, if you want to see how to build a very simple self-hosting compiler. Uh, there's another thing along these lines, uh, also a C-like compiler uh, from the IOCCC, and um, that is Leonard Augustin's IOCCC. Probably this one. Yeah. Um, okay, so it doesn't. Okay. But anyway, this is another. Um, okay, this is really, I don't know why they have all this junk in the header. Um, I mean, this is still pretty obfuscated, so I don't, I thought this was the unobfuscated version, but anyway, um, this is also a, so this is not real C, I think. It's not a real C language. Uh, it's, uh, C like, or maybe it is actually C. No, maybe it is a C subset as well. Yeah, looks like it. Uh, one difference between, um, this and the Fabrice Spillard entry, this, I think, you know, it precedes it by five years is that this uh, uses a bytecode interpreter. Um, Whereas uh, the other, you know, Fabrice Bellard stuff uh, directly emits uh, x86 code. But anyway, um, I know I, I'm, I'm certain that I know an unobfuscated version of this, but um, maybe the spaces just got compressed out of this thing when we opened it. I don't know what, what went on there. It looked a little bit corrupted. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, those are three IOCC entries that you might want to check out just for fun. They definitely have sort of cover material we covered in a different way maybe um so if you're interested in this sort of stuff uh, check it out um yeah anyway um so that was uh one set of references i guess the other one is uh, which which is more famous nowadays is jonesforth um I already have it open. This is not the official page. This is just a mirror. Um, but jo Jonesforth is a, um, uh, a fourth implementation. It's an x86 assembly uh, using, well, using GAS, GAS syntax, at and syntax, and all that stuff that comes with GAS. Um, and, and one thing that's notable about it, it's written as a literate program. So it's not really, you know, like the ratio of, of explanation to assembly code uh, is very much uh, biased towards explanation. So uh, again, this sort of explains forth from the vantage point of how you might implement it. And um, I mean, this is, I, I know I, I know hardcore forth people uh, will find faults with some implementation choices in this because it's kind of, you know, much like the way I'll be doing it, actually, it's kind of coming from the vantage point of someone who's maybe not a uh, sort of <laughs> a, a, a died in the wool forth programmer. And so some of the choices uh, are probably different than what a, uh, an old school fourth per person might uh, might do, um, but still, I, I think this is a a very good tutorial implementation of it. Uh, and there are some techniques that are standard fourth techniques that I'll use, uh, like indirect threading um, for for um, for the way code is represented, which are explained in here as well. But uh, other than that, uh, I don't think we'll really be following it very much. Um, I, I, I read through it last night just to remind myself of some details, but I already forgot half of it. Uh, so I'll be uh, <laughs> I'll be kind of reinventing or refiguring out stuff on the fly, I suppose. But this is a, a good thing to read if you want something in much more detail than what I'll be covering for um, for the explanations. Um, so yeah, anyway, there's the the assembly code here. There's also then a bunch of um, 
of bootstrapping and sort of library stuff in the .f file, which is uh, you know actual fourth code. Um, one of the cool things about fourth is that you can bootstrap from very starting from very little in the sort of the hard coded implementation, which is what Sean's code does in the um, in this entry. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it like he does. Like he's very strict about, you know, he doesn't implement plus as a primitive because it can be implemented in terms of minus by seeing, you know, zero, uh, by, by doing like, you know, negating one of the operands and so on and before you subtract them. Um, so that kind of minimalism is, is you know, wouldn't be used in a real implementation. Um, but in, in terms of bootstrapping from a core subset of primitives, that's very much in the, in the fourth uh, ethos. So in that sense, it's a uh, he does more of that than Jones does in this uh, uh, implementation. Um, but yeah, like what, what? And I think, I mean, I don't think. I, I think this is like there's some stuff. Uh, by the way, Jones Forth, I think, is indebted at least in some areas to uh, Sean's implementation. Um, like maybe the way he does uh, branch, the way if is implemented, I think is almost exactly the same. Um, I mean, yeah, and, and I'm, I, I actually don't know what, how this differs from other fourth implementations that are more kind of canonical and standard, like using standard techniques, but, um, you know, th this is like, it, it, I don't know if you can just eyeball this, but this looks almost identical. Um, I mean, you end up, most fourth implementations probably do something along these lines anyway, um, but, um. I know for a fact that, like, I remember there was a message bar board thread where he explicitly mentioned uh, Sean's IOCCC entry as an inspiration for this. So uh, pretty cool. All right. Um, all righty. So. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Um, so yeah, um, the way I was planning on starting today is to um, to basically start um, implementing the core execution flow of a fourth interpreter, um, and um, you know basically hand coding stuff in assembly to test it before we have a full you know uh, parser. I mean you don't need much parsing in fourth or dictionary lookups and stuff like that, but um, kind of really starting as, as taking a bottom up approach as much as possible, testing things as they come online the way I've been doing all along with bitwise. Um, and so as a result, um, uh, even be long before we have a full four system, we should be able to test some stuff uh, pretty easily. So um, I think one thing we probably want to do is um, let's see. Um, right now, let's see. Right now, um, you know, we were just doing. Oh, actually, before I jump in, let me just mention I implemented. I, I forgot to implement ifs in the uh, macro system for the assembler. I put this in last night. Uh, it was pretty easy to do. Um, it's like one function that handles everything. Um, and um, one thing that was interesting about the way it shook out is that um, macro expansion is suppressed in the branches that are not taken, which means you can do recursive macros as long as the macro recursion is guarded. And so, for example, here I'm using basically tail recursion, um, using an accumulator. Uh, you know, using ifs and, and macro recursion in order to calculate factorials and print them to the screen. So factorial four is, you know, four times three times two, um, which is 24. And so if you, um, you can see it prints 24 to the screen. If you do this, it should be five times 24. Um, Six, right? Oh no, five, not four. Yeah. So anyway, so you you can see how that works. Um, anyway, just wanted to demo that in case I end up using ifs, but um, the syntax is pretty straightforward. It's dot if and then an expression, dot else, dot else if, and dot end if. Um, 
So that's it for that. Um, all right. So yeah, I think um, for, for what we want to do, we want to have a separate file. So far, we've just been using these multi-line strings, which is very convenient when you're kind of working on the test code at the same time you're working on the assembler itself. But um, we will definitely want to um, what you call it. You'll definitely want to have a separate file for what we're doing. So um, I'm just going to put it next to the assembler for now. Or maybe not. Um, maybe I will put it here. Um, maybe I'll just put it here. So just to, to keep things uh, without creating new files, whatever, I'm going to try keeping, um, I don't know. I'm going to just create a little test case here. Um, a lot of this stuff should really be well, maybe this is a good opportunity, actually. Let's see. To factor this out into a function in a bit, but let's just get started doing it in line. Um, I guess I can't really do that. So that no, that's totally bogus. I shouldn't do it that way. Um, um all right. Um what is it, CL? Screen myself. FSeq file, offset, seek, end. To seek, end, right. Or six set, yeah. Um, can I remember the offhand order for this thing? Okay, so it's the buffer first. Um, Every buff size. Um, boom, 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 boom. Uh, 
function call with too few arguments. Oh, count, right, right, right. So we just say this is, and I guess the count is always returned, so this should be one, right? Um, invalid type. Oh, of course, this is a void star. So we have to say, um, What's that thing called? Oh, right. Uh. Am I high? Oh, wait, RB, I don't know why it's... Sometimes I forget basic stuff, but this seems a bit much. So if I do R, that should definitely work, but RB should work as well. I wonder if there's something... Weird in the... Um, really? Valid file open mode? This is so embarrassingly basic, I really don't see what's going on. I think I hadn't recompiled from when I was just writing B. Okay, so that's fine. It just means the working directory isn't correct, which I have no problem with. We can change that. Um, Size zero. So, what did this return? That frame returns the count of things that has been read. Maybe just, well, let's do something like this. Okay. Um. Just 
probably assemble file file name assembler. Right. Um, Um, ugh. incredibly bad auto indentation. Um, let's not have any of these. So these are all legal because we haven't assembled anything. Um, but if we do like Oh, interesting. Why does it say that's illegal? It's definitely a bug in the Um, oh no, that is right, but it's because it's printing it.
Okay. All right. Looks good. Um, and so now we should just be able to work in this file. All right. Um, let's see. So, um, the, 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 the basic primitive in fourth is called a word and it's basically, it's like a function you're used to in the sense that, um, um, the definition of one word can invoke other words to do work and so on. Um, and, um, the, the, the way, let's see, to back up a bit, um, in fourth, as I mentioned earlier, it's a stack oriented language, which means that, um, you know, it's, it, there's no local variables. Um, you can do global variables using just memory reads, writes, and you can wrap that up very nicely. But the basic way that data flows between words uh, and how words are composed is through the parameter stack, which is usually just called the stack. So um, we are going to want to have a stack and, uh, and actually, um, one thing that will be kind of notable about uh, the way we do register allocation in a pure assembly program like this compared to how you might do it in a, um, you know, in the kind of local register allocation you normally see for a you know, C compiler or something like that, is that there are going to be a lot of globally allocated registers that have a fixed role throughout the program. Um, and as a result, we'll want to have sort of shorthand names for some of those. Uh, normally, I don't consider that super valuable um, if you're writing like a single function that's supposed to have a standard calling convention, but in something like this, um, both we, we, we both improve clarity and reduce, you know, amount of code and, and improve performance by having basically not having to shuffle registers around or whatever, and just having fixed roles. And that's sort of, sort of everyone knows that say X1 is the stack pointer, X2 is the return stack pointer, X3 is the program counter or whatever. Um, so, um, I just realized, as I said that, that we will want, rather than using macros for that, um, let's add a, um, and I'll probably be doing this as I realize there's features that, like sort of five minute features I want to add um, that we don't support. Let's add a way to define uh, custom register names. Um, and gas has something like this too. You could do this, you could do this by just doing, for example, uh, dot define SP um, X1, uh, and then using, uh, you know, the macro expansion sigil uh, dollar, but um, it would be nice if we could do this instead and just use SP. And uh, basically the way this will work is it will just create a simple table entry, which says that, you know, SP has whatever register number of, of this. Uh, and so this will be extremely trivial to implement. So um, let's just jam it in here. So um, we parse a name and um, and then we parse in a reg and then I guess we already have what's the name is it parse sim yeah so we we let's use this one. Uh, parse sim, parse reg, and then we just set this kind to be a, uh, what is it, uh, sim x reg, sim reg equals reg reg, or just reg, because I think Oh, it's called X reg. All right. I think that's literally all we have to do because things are already set up with the symbol table to uh, to work like this. We don't have hard coded like register names. Those are just simple table entries. And so with this, we should be able to do um, like SPS1. And then if we want to 
um, you know, do something like this. It should just work now. Um, so let's, I have to recompile to make sure that command is now available. But, um, right, so you can see this actually uses x1 for that. Uh, and if we had like x8, then uh, it would use x8. You can see x8 is 4. So anyway, um, so that will be useful. Um, so yeah, there's a stack pointer. And um, so that's one kind of register role we're going to fix. Um, another one, um, I actually don't know what they traditionally call this in fourth, but I'm just going to call it PC, uh, even though it's not it's not the risk five program counter, it's the fourth program counter. It points to basically the next word to be executed. So it's like a program counter, except it points to uh, word pointers rather than, um, you know, uh, risk five instructions directly. Um, so uh, I'll, if I find out what a more canonical name for this thing is in, uh, in the fourth world, I will rename it. But um, for now, this is kind of evocative. Um, let's see. OK. Um, just think. So we have that. We have PC. OK. Um, and with that, I think we could already define as an example a simple, um, like, I don't know, let's just call it add. I guess we should use double indentation for our stuff. Um, add, and um, add is going to. All oh, right. The other the, the other thing I forgot about. Um, we also need a return stack. So um, in order to be able to nest word definition, so that one word can defer to another, you just like with you know, like a the the, the kind of stack you use to execute a C program, you also need um, w w which you know if you think of what the C stack stores, it's both used to pass some parameters and some data to store local variables, but also it stores the return address so you know where to return to when you return from a function. Um, and um, so one thing that's notable about fourth is it has separate stacks for parameters and for return addresses. Uh, and so if you hear me say stack, the stack, it usually just means the parameter stack where kind of data is passed uh, between words. And return stack means where you know, return addresses are for returning from words. So um, let's use this register assignment. Um, OK, let's see. So um, um, we're going to be using an, implementa an implementation style called indirect threading. And the idea behind, in, behind uh, is that the, the idea behind indirect threading is basically the following: um, a word definition, which is like you know the code that constitutes uh, a function body, if if this was like a C, com, uh, a C compiler or something like that, is going to be a list of addresses um, to the words you want to call. Um, and so, for example, um, and, and uh, yeah, actually, so let me show you an example. Uh, let me take something that doesn't have immediate operands. Um, suppose you have the um, suppose you have the value forty two on top of the stack, and uh, I think this is what Jones uses in his example. But suppose you have a, a value on top of the stack like forty two, and you have a, a a word called double which you know, basically pops or, you know, it doubles the top uh, value on the stack. So if 42 is on the stack, it will replace it by 84. Um, and so, and I think this is exactly what he uses. So if you define a new word called quadruple and, um, and, um, 
and quadruple is defined as first doubling and then doubling again. This is overall going to quadruple what's on top of the stack by the time it returns. Um, the definition of quadruple is essentially go just going to be, uh, actually, it's going to consist of, of, of three word addresses. Uh, it's going to be basically double, double, and then exit. Exit corresponds to, you know, you can think of it as corresponding to the semicolon that ends a definition, but really it's like returning from the current word execution. Um, the terminology is so weird with fourth that I'm constantly having to translate between how I normally think about this stuff to fourth. So uh, apologies if some of the terminology is a little bit wacky. Um, but uh, that's basically a word definition. So just like, you know, if this was like a bytecode, um, if this was like a bytecode VM, you know, a typical bytecode VM, uh, the instructions would essentially consist of um, of opcodes, and um, you know if this was RISC-V machine code, you would have uh, you would have these uh, four byte instructions typically um, that describe what to do. In this case, um, we just have a stream of pointers to the word definitions, basically. So you can imagine there's some place in memory where the definition for double lives. Um, and you just have a bunch of pointers to those definitions in, uh, you know, in the definition of quadruple, in the code for quadruple. So that's the idea. Um, indirect threading basically means that a definition consists of uh, a header word, which is called the code word. And so the first four bytes of a word definition is a code word. And the code word is a pointer to, like, code, risk risk five code to execute. And then the remainder of, uh, of the word definition is, you know, for example, uh, a list of, of these guys, like it's some way to interpret, uh, it, it's some kind of auxiliary data that the function you call that's in the code word that, that that kind of processes. So you can have the same code word used with different, um, uh, with, with different word contents. Um, Anyway, so, so let me just start maybe implementing it and it's easier to see what I mean. Um, and yeah, go, go read some of those references I mentioned if, if none of this makes sense. But let me just uh, start coding a little bit. So um, let's see, a word definition. Um, if I want to have something like add, Add is, or, or, or let's say double even, to make it even simpler, it only has one argument. So double, we have a stack pointer, um, and we use the normal, uh, we assume the stack grows upward. Um, and so um, what that means is, um, let me allocate some temp registers. Um, and these are again going to be sort of fixed roles. Um, now I'm just going to call them this. I'm going to put them later in the register file. Um, so uh, let's see. So SP is the stack pointer, which means that the first operand, or actually let's do add. Let's do add. The first operand of add is uh, eight bytes from the top. Second one is four bytes because, you know, again, this is like the post increment, you know, this is. Write it like this. Um, that's basically what this means. I'm going to try to be more religious about comments since it's assembly code. Um, the reason it's eight and four rather than two and one is because the stack pointer is, you know, it points to words rather than bytes. But in assembly, we have to do bytewise arithmetic for the addressing. Um, but that's basically the idea here. And so then we we do the add. It's maybe a little bit. L let me be pedantic about the, I mean, these comments are maybe too self-explanatory, but uh, let me just do it like this for now. Um, and then finally, we have to subtract four. Well, we can do it like this. Subtract four from the stack pointer. Um, subtract four from the stack pointer. Um, add these, and then we have to write the result back. 
and we have to write it back to the new top of the stack after the subtraction. Um, which is like this. Now, um, so that's the idea. Um, you know, that's just standard kind of stack manipulation stuff. Um, but the question is, what do you do when you're done? So suppose you're calling this word from another word, uh, then you have to return to where you left off. And um, that's where the return stack comes in. So we're going to define a macro called next and um, next is responsible. I guess we don't use the return stack directly. Exit, use, exit is what will pop the return stack. Next just advances the program counter essentially. So next, um, next loads, let's see, loads from the program counter I guess I can just use temp. Next, uh, loads from the program counter, um, increments the program counter by four, and then um, I guess let's do direct threaded code first because Jones kind of shows that too first if you want to sort of follow along a little bit with the order he does things in. You, it, it's it's not the most flexible way of doing things, but uh, it requires one less level of interaction. So, um, so we load from the program counter and at one um, and advance it and then um, we have to jump through T1. So what that means is the thing we're actually loading is the thing we're loading here is the address of one of these guys, like something like add. And then we jump there and advance past it. Um, and so what this means is at the end of every, uh, at the end of every of, of these word definitions, you know, we call this function sort of in the, in the tail position to go and process the next thing in line. And what that means is rather than having an interpreter loop, it's almost as if um, the, the, this thing here, as simple as it is, is the interpreter. It's the, it's the body of the interpreter loop. But rather than having that in a centralized location in the code, we, we just inline it at the end of every word rather than returning to the interpreter loop or tail calling into the interpreter loop or something like that. We just kind of inline it right here using a macro. So that's kind of the idea. Um, all right. So... Um, in order for this to work, we need to um, we need to set aside some space for the stack. So um, let's say the stack. Let's first make sure we I guess we have auto growing buffers for the assembler now, so that's not a problem. Let's say the stack starts at this location. Um, um, Okay, so stack uh, stack starts here, stack ends there. Um, 
in the init code. I'm just going to call it init. In the init code, we want to um, load the stack start address to SP. Um, we want to load, so for now, let's not worry about um, Do it like this. Okay. Um, let's load the PC to point to the start of the program. And then let's, oops, let's execute the first instruction just to, to bootstrap this thing. Um, and so Trying to remember if I do this, will that actually work? It should work. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to just emit like the addresses, the absolute addresses of things uh, as data. Um, let me do, I guess we need one more thing to sort of bootstrap this. Oh, and the problem is we can't call this add because that's reserved for, um, let me call this add code. Um, or maybe do, do add, do push. Um, so do push is going to basically, you know, the idea is that if you have, if you want to do something like this, you know, push one, push two, and then add them, uh, push the result on the stack. Um, you need a way of basically getting these numbers onto the stack. Um, you could have hard coded like push one, which, you know, pushes the specific thing one, but we want to have this reusable thing. And then we want to get the immediate operand of what to push. We want to get that from the, from the program, uh, stream, the sort of the, again, I, I can't remember, I, like all the terminology before this. So un like I would call it the instruction stream, but I don't think they call it that. Um, but anyway, so the, the point about this is the program counter at this point has already been incremented. And so what we want to do is we want to load whatever the program pointer counts to, um, because that's going to be our immediate operand. And, um, and then we want, to, um, we want to push that onto the stack. And so, um, you know, kind of, Um, well, so store SP T1 and then increment it and then next. Um, all right, this should be enough to test something. Uh, 
Um, let me just see here. All right, and then as a as a test program, you could do do push, and then one, do push, two, do add. Um, okay. So this should already be enough. see here but I can't remember if these things here work with labels um, let me just check that right uh, it only works with parse cons that's definitely not what you want you want to be able to um, parse an arbitrary expression Um, I guess maybe only for this case here. Um, Well, I'm surprised that assembled, to be honest. Like, I'm surprised I didn't have any syntax errors. Um, so let's see. X1 is SP, X3 is, right. So the very first thing we do is we load the stack pointer um, right to point to 4K. And that's actually what it needs to point to. Um, is this? Correct. Oh yeah, this is inefficient. And then X3 points to there. X8 is T1. Why did it subtract 8? I mean, that must be part of the LA. Because it did the AUIPC. Right, so this is PC relative, and this is minus eight because okay, this seems like a bug. The absolute address should be 
should be this. That should be the absolute address, but it's treating it as a non-relative. So that seems like a bug. Um, I mean, I know other ways of doing this. I could just do li directly. I could just load the immediate directly for those. But like, I want to figure out why this is happening. Because this has an absolute address of 8k. Um, and I'm asking to load that absolute address. Now it's using AYPC to be position independent. And that's fine, but... Um, I would expect, like, let me show you what I mean. So in this case, this looks right to me because the program counter is currently zero. And so the absolute address is 4,000, you know, 4K. Um, and so, you know, minus zero, that is still the same. So there is no fix up. But for this, the program counter is eight. So this here should be 2,200, right? Oh no, this should be that minus. Let me just look at these other cases here, just to, just to see what I could be missing. Um, I mean, I can just do this. We can see what it is. So in this case, um, asm adder is zero. And so, wait, what? Oh, okay, this is pass number one. Sorry. Don't care about this is past zero. Okay, now we're in the real past where everything should be resolved. 
Um, so in this case, the, the adder is zero, um, the target address is 4K, the difference is 4K. That's what I would expect. Now, the target address is that, Um, right, the current address is 8. Oh, this should be... Well, I do think that's right. Yeah, so... As an adder... The offset, right, so you subtracted it. Is it because of the sign extension stuff? Okay, I have to, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole on this right now. Um, but this seems very wrong. Let me do a quick test where I do you know like let me try just loading from this label which sh shouldn't behave differently like it's using the same kind of logic um, Oh, wait, now it's working? I'm confusing myself. Why did that change the behavior? Oh, it's because, I think it's just because the disassembler, gotcha, it's because the disassembler doesn't take into account the whole offset thing. But it does load correctly. I'm just high. But I guess it was good to clarify to myself that is what, what was going on. False alarm. It was behaving correctly. Um, all right. So so let's see what's going on here. Let's see if this works. So now these are locked and loaded, and we load the current word. We bump program counter and we jump through that to this to twenty eight, which I guess is this, which is not that far. It is yeah, it is it would be the next thing, so I guess that is actually correct. Um so we load that thing into X eight, which should be one. 
and then we increment that and then we store that back to the top of the stack increment the top of the stack and then we go to the next instruction which is going to be 28 again and so this time I guess it should be yeah, two there and then store that, that back now we should go further not to 28 but to like 30 something oh sorry even further 50 something and then we do yeah x8 is loaded with that then we decrement the stack pointer so x8 should now be three and then we store that back and now there's no more thing on the stack so um let me do a just a, as a debugging tool let me do a poor man's um like the kind of thing we've been doing before where um load what's on top of the stack um and then I guess put was it uh, store to put char no um, subtract subtract oh no add it I guess and then do that um, What do we call that? All right, let's get there's get char. Um, something like this. This is just single digit printing. Um, the kind of simple thing we've been doing before. Um, and so let's do that. Three. Store that back to top of the stack, and then um, increment it, and then go. This would now be the print routine. So load three, and then add forty-eight, which is the ASCII conversion, uh, and then. Okay, you can see it here. Um, I guess let's print new line as well. Actually, that's kind of interesting. I think it's called emit in classic. We can actually do all this math that way so yeah just take the top and actually um, let's have some more primitives this thing the emit traditionally actually pops the thing so we have to do load it pop the stack store this out go to the next um, and then what you would do is you would do do emit print 
um, we have to subtract, so we'll just say minus that to add um, and then emit it. And then emit a new line. Ooh. That's interesting. Oh no, I just got the order wrong. No, that's not right. Um, oh right, that's the problem, I didn't push it. Let's push it. No, I guess it's line oriented. I can't really do that. Um, let's see. Push that. Push that. Add them. Push that. Add it. Emit. Push that. Emit. Let's try. Okay, so let's see when this thing gets printed to the screen. Sorry. It should be plus. Okay, so you can see the three here <laughs> hidden along with all the other crap. Um, let me um, just add something to the command loop so we don't have to single step all the time. Actually, let's just call this put char. Do put char. Do put char. And then I wouldn't say yeah. make one called uh, 
to get char. He's going to push that on the stack. So, um, something like that. Okay, so it prints three and then a new line, uh, which is correct. Um, let's try actually doing something different, which is you know, we kind of did. Let's just comment this out for a sec. Um, do get char, do get char, do add, um, and then we do the ASCII conversion to put char. And get char just to wait so it doesn't exit. Oh, I don't have to recompile. One, two. Oh, that's not right. It, let's see, has to get char. Um, do push minus because we have to now do ASCII to digit conversion. Let's see, get the character, push, minus that thing, add them, get the other thing, okay, let's do it single stepped. Three, so that's ASCII three, and so minus forty eight, and then it should add it. Just and it actually gets three at the end. <coughs> Stores that to the top of the stack. Now it should do the. Or four, and that should add three and four, and should be seven. Seven plus okay, so what did it actually print here? It printed zero. Forty eight, so it didn't actually add anything to it.
So at this point, you should have the numerical values of the two things you just read on top of the stack. And you add them, and then, oh, here. I have to do this. That's the reason. It's stupid. Three, four, seven. Correct. All right. Um, you know, three, six, four, three, six, nine. Yeah, okay. So that works. Um, all right. So that's the basic idea behind how to handle flat command streams. Um, and I guess the way to think about it is that rather than having opcodes, this is called direct threading, rather than having opcodes that are indices into a table, and so that every time you want to process an opcode, like in a normal bytecode VM, you do a table lookup or you, do, you use a switch statement, which is essentially a jump table under the hood, um, you just directly encode a pointer to code that knows how to execute that opcode. So you just have the direct code addresses for the operations in the stream. Um, and immediate operands are in the stream as well, and something like push knows what to grab, basically, in the stream. So um, that's the idea behind direct threading. Um, indirect threading, as the name suggests, involves a level of indirection beyond this, where um, rather than... Um, rather than just pointing directly to the code, you point to like a header, which in, which in the first word of the header points to some interpreter, like a code, like is the code word, and then following that is some other stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember the usual organization is, and also do we have time for it? No, I think we're already done for today. Uh, it didn't get as far as I wanted, but um, you know we, we we have a basic direct threaded interpreter now. The thing we don't have is we don't have um, you know what we basically have here we, is we have a hard coded program which is a sequence of instructions. But you want to be able to say a word consists of this set of things like this, and then you want to be able to call those words from elsewhere. But the problem with direct threading is that those words themselves are not RISC-V machine code. So if you look at something like all these things we wrote here, these are like hard-coded implementations of words. Um, but our word definitions are essentially going to look like this. And these things themselves, you cannot jump to program start, right? Like you can't, you, you can't do, you know, you, you can't do like program start like this because it's not RISC-V machine code. It's our own format. And so that's where indirect threading is helpful, where basically the thing you jump to is an interpreter for the word. And the interpreter um, for this is going to essentially just call just call next in a loop, more or less. Like it's not going to do very much. Um, anyways, uh, I think that's all I have time for today. Uh, have a good weekend, everyone. I will uh, continue with this <laughs> pretty slow paced. Uh, fourth implementation walkthrough on Monday, which I guess will be Sunday for people in the U.S. And uh, I will cover direct threading and return stacks and all that stuff at that point. But uh, anyway, this is a small beginning. So uh, see everyone next time. And uh, yeah, have a good weekend.